Well, thank you all. And thank you, Judy, for getting us going with such a, a deeply thoughtful and provocative thank kickoff you. here. Um, I'm so excited to be out of Washington right now <laughs> and <laughs> talking about innovation and problem solving. Uh, having just come from talking to a lot of the non-problem solvers, so uh, <laughs> this is indeed a treat. Um, We've seen, you've, you've, you're surrounded by the evidence of the problems, the urban challenges, water and food scarcity. And as Dr. Roden just noted, these are only a few of the pressing and dynamic challenges of this new century. The men and women here today are uniquely qualified to talk about how innovation can attack these problems and indeed solve them. Because they are some of the world's foremost and innovative thought leaders, visionaries, transformers in their own industries, in their fields, from security to healthcare to human rights. And taken together, when we look at the people who are joining us here today, they have received more than 100 honorary doctorate degrees, two presidential medals of freedom, <laughs> and indeed a Nobel Prize. Um, these are individuals who have changed the world, and in a moment you'll be hearing from all of them um, Wilm Elfrink is Cisco's Chief Globalization Officer, and this is a, a pretty unique title. Uh, you have, according to Cisco, the most globally relevant company in the world, and that means implementing a truly international business model and engaging the emerging IT market in Asia. Mr. Elfrink has moved to Bangalore, India, in order to reach those goals, and only two years after taking up residence in Bangalore, a leading Indian newspaper named him one of the city's 50 most, most influential citizens. In 1992, when innocent Somalians were still being killed during the last throes of their civil war, and we see uh, just how relevant this is to us at this moment today, President Mary Robinson of Ireland was the first head of state, the first anywhere in the globe to visit them. Since that day, Mary Robinson has never left the front lines in the fight for human rights. During her tenure as United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, she ensured that whatever work the UN did, advancing the cause of social justice was part and parcel of its mission. And she continues today to be a passionate, outspoken, and uh, leading advocate, one of the world's most effective advocates for conflict resolution. Mati Kahavi. <laughs> Unlike, um, we can applaud for all of them <laughs> as we introduce them. Mati Kahavi, unless, unlike some of our other panelists, his success is best expressed by news that you have not read. He is founder and CEO of AGT International, an $8 billion private security company that has developed cutting edge methodologies to hone in on terrorist threats, even when they are barely recognizable. And through their efforts, Mr. Kahavi and AGT have revolutionized the way that we can detect and deter those who would infiltrate national borders and try to influence global efforts through terror, including cyber terror. Dr. Paul Farmer, Chair of the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at the Harvard Medical School, Deputy Special Envoy for Haiti, and the subject of a recent biography entitled, A Man Who Would Cure the World. Dr. Farmer's nonprofit, Partners in Health seeks to bridge the gap between social justice and public health, to advocate on behalf of those who are poor because they are sick, and those who are sick because they are poor. From Peru to Siberia to Rwanda, from leaning on drug companies to providing free medical care, Dr. Farmer is one of the world's foremost and most effective advocates for the poor. In the mid-1970s, in his home country of Bangladesh, Professor Muhammad Yunus gave 42 basket weavers small loans from his own pocket. The loans were paid back at an extraordinary success rate, as the world now knows. And now, nearly 40 years later, microfinance is still succeeding. Professor Yunus finds that the scale has changed, though. He has gone from loaning his pocket change to loaning billions of dollars. 42 basket weavers in Bangladesh have been transformed into 150 million poor families now lifted out of poverty all over the world. As his Nobel Prize citation read, quote, every single individual on earth has both the potential and the right to live a decent life across cultures and civilizations. 
Muhammad Yunus has shown that even the poorest of the poor can work to bring about their own development. And finally, our host. During her tenure as president of the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Judith Roden unleashed a revolutionary transformation of an urban neighborhood in West Philadelphia mired in poverty and decay. Under her leadership, the university rose from 16th to 4th in the US News and World Report rankings. And since 2005, Dr. Roden has led the Rockefeller Foundation, as you all know, making historic changes at this institution as well. She has worked to bring high quality, affordable health care to developing nations. She has bolstered efforts to improve the job security of American workers here at home. She has championed the critical agenda of building resilience to the impacts of climate change. In no small part, Dr. Roden is really redefining the foundation's history of the 21st century. Now, when I said that this panel, and now you can applaud for all of them. <laughs> When I said initially that this panel was qualified, it was a vast understatement. Because we're about to hear a discussion from some of the most innovative thought leaders. It's really an innovation dream team. With the challenges facing humanity today, challenges with solutions that are elusive now and are only becoming more elusive by the moment, this is the dream team that we need. Because as Dr. Roden said in your opening remarks, Judy, we can only succeed when our problem solving evolves as fast as the problems themselves. And right now, I think we are well behind. So without wasting any more time, I wanted to ask all of you about the emerging or existing innovations that you see that offer the greatest opportunities to the poor, to the vulnerable. I'd like to ask each of you to respond, um, perhaps starting with you. OK, thank you. Um, so, if you think about uh, the, the challenges for the 21st century, uh, that uh, and we talk about an enormous demographic shift, the U.S. is aging, Europe is shrinking, and then we have an explosion of population in Africa, the Middle East, India, and, uh, the world population will grow from 6 to 9 billion people. Um, urbanization as such, that is one of the themes of uh, today, um, and that the next decade, 700 million people will be urbanized, and that's a number. Uh, but when you scale that down, you talk about 300,000 a day. And I, I had the privilege uh, to write a report for the Indian government um, on what it would take uh, to make that a process. And it's globalizing from 30%, because that's the number what it is in India now, uh, to 50%, the worldwide average, uh, that 700 million people. And you know the, these numbers, how do you scale for that? Um, Cisco is a company, uh, it's a networking company. Um, so I went out and lived now in Bangalore since four years with my wife and two dogs and two children. And that because we wanted to be in the middle and to feel and to really understand what these issues are on a daily basis. Um, and so via corporate social responsibility projects, um, and we have taken a big project in India, and after the floods, uh, we have rebuilt a village of 3,000 people and basically gave them access um, virtually to healthcare, to education. And what you see now in these villages that you get an economic cycle going, um, also with microfinancing, of course, <laughs> Professor Yunov. And, and it, it means that it's not just urbanization as such, it's also uh, what we call communities. And that if you give people access in rural areas, of course, to shelter, to food, and then to uh, a job, healthcare, and education, that the need to move becomes a little bit lower, and you can basically delay the process. Um, and because in the cities, if you, if you think about a city like Mumbai, a thousand people a day coming to uh, the city, how do you give people affordable housing? How do you give them food? Uh, the, the magnitude of the issue is tremendous. Uh, we think technology, um, and then virtualization of resources, um, either for education, for healthcare, that create jobs like that that could be an innovative way to move forward. It strikes me, Dr. Farmer, that in places like Haiti, how do you even think about innovation when you're faced with remediation for disaster? Are there innovative ways that you can approach a true crisis, not the chronic crisis that we see in overpopulated and underserved areas, but in, in places where the need is 
excruciating and sur very survival is at stake for the entire population. Well, you know, if I had to identify what I think the biggest innovation is, it, it probably would be, you know, alas, outside of public health and medicine, it would be, again, the creation of these new platforms of, of communication. When, um, I liked your expression, uh, the vir virtualization. It's hard to virtualize food and water and medical care, but I, I, I think the, the, as a metaphor, mm -hmm. um, getting back to a place like Haiti, um, meaning th these new information technologies allow us to, to monitor, to track, to, get, to have a handle of what's going on now. After the, I'd like to compare Haiti, if, if I may, for a second, just to, to Rwanda, another place where I've worked a lot, I'm actually working with, with Judy and members of her team on uh, an endeavor, and of course with the Rwandan officials on an endeavor called eHealth, uh, using these new platforms to promote health. Mm -hmm. That requires um, not just the virtualization of things, but actually the, mo the delivery of basic services um, for not just for vaccine preventable illness, of course, which probably, and looking back, if someone asked this question 50 years ago, I think uh, certainly uh, the prevention of uh, illness with vaccines would have been on that list. And, and we still have the same vaccines. Now the question is, how can we deliver them? And I think using these new platforms, um, we can uh, do a better job not just delivering services as a physician or an agricultural outreach worker or someone working on food security or water security, but on tracking our progress. That's, uh, I was shocked after the earthquake in Haiti to find out that uh, we had not really ever used these novel platforms for tracking, meaning the internet, and uh, uh, we would never used them to monitor a response to a, a disaster before. Looking back at the Asian tsunami, for example, aid pledges. It was no good sense looking back then, that's just 2004, at what had happened to pledges being made. Now we're really trying to track those uh, in, in real time. Uh, what, what's happening to pledges? How are they being delivered? That doesn't solve the delivery problem, but I think it offers us uh, important platforms for monitoring and evaluation, which again is development jargon, I know, but uh, having a good sense of what it is we're doing so that we can have feedback loops that allow us to do it better. I think that is a radical uh, change in medicine and public health. Mary Robinson, if you could think about innovation and what has changed from Somalia then, when you first experienced it, and Somalia now, uh, with some level of political pro progress, but uh, an environmental disaster that has brought us hmm. this famine. Well, having been in Somalia again a week ago uh, after 19 years the sad thing is very little innovation uh, Somalia suffers not least from uh, the kind of problem of the T word terrorism the Al-Shabaab and that has been a sort of uh, way of kind of putting it into a sort of box of like, you know Somalia we don't deal with because of the terrorism and I was very impressed with the two organizations, I was with three organizations in fact, but two of them have been working in Somalia for the last 20 years and working with, uh, in areas that Al-Shabaab controls, but under the radar, quietly, on health, on education, etc. It's very difficult, but it's doable. We could do a great deal more. What I was thinking about when I was um, coming here, and very much welcoming this innovation, innovation forum, um, was that it has to be innovation to purpose. And what's the purpose in the 21st century? I think one of the main purposes, and it's been touched on already, is the incredible inequalities of our world today. Uh, you know, startling. Um, you know, if, if we think of ourselves as human beings living in the same planet, totally unacceptable inequalities in our world today. So innovation has to be to purpose to deal with those. And I'd like to sort of build on the idea of the uh, technological platforms and. Um, uh, Paul was just talking about platforms for monitoring and evaluation. I would also say platforms for participation, because that's one of the very important movements at the moment. It's what the informal poor are doing. Um, a lot of them are women, I'm glad to say. And it's, you know, it's Slum Dwellers International, it's We Go, the women in the informal sector, it's uh, Sewa in India um, with my fellow elder um, Ilabat, over 1.2 million members of Sewa. And they're involved in one of the platforms that I think gives us an, an indication of the kind of innovation 
and that is the Clean Stones um, global platform. Uh, 2.7 billion people in our world today still cook on uh, firewood, uh, firewood and animal dung and ingest, and it's bad for their health, and of course, the vast majority are women. 2.7 billion out of just coming up to 7 billion. It's a huge number. And um, how can we have a world where we have the capabilities that we have? So I hope that this forum really challenges us. We've got to use the technologies, not just, and I agree, to, to monitor and to, to be able to, but also to, to create the participation. And that means having affordable, clean energy for the poorest. We made a big mistake, in my view, and I was in the UN at the time, um, with the Millennium Development Goals. The first Millennium Development Goal in tackling poverty and hunger should have set access to affordable, clean energy. Now, and that would have made a huge difference to the 1.4 billion of no access to electricity and so on. It's, it's, it, that's where we can be very innovative, I think. Uh, Hillary Clinton was just in India last week mm. and went to a demonstration project on clean stoves. Mm. But it's just beginning yeah. to be mm. taken seriously. How do we scale? Exactly. Mm. And speaking of scale, Dr. Yunus, uh, you started as small as, as one could imagine, and now it has just exploded into what is almost conventional wisdom, the whole idea of microfinance. What do you see as the, the next step, the innovation that perhaps increases participation and, and access for the women, the women and the families you serve? Uh, on the innovation part, let me start uh, by drawing attention to that. Innovation in action is one thing, which uh, each one individual action has innovative idea. Uh, innovation in the framework is another thing, uh, which creates many activities. In the Once you have addressed the framework part, of it. and if you can address the <clears throat> innovative framework in a way, it creates lots of innovative work. That becomes the most powerful one. Uh, so we should be looking for the more, uh, while we're doing the innovation work, also look for the framework which helps changing these uh, conditions and so on. Uh, this, I should emphasize this is a most uh, appropriate time to bring those innovations because we are frustrated in so many fronts, on economic fronts, on social fronts, on environment fronts, on food fronts, and health fronts, and so on. So this is a time where we can really um, redesign the whole system, not just work within the system. So challenging the system and finding out a way out in a different way, because the system which created all this mess cannot find ways to remove those mess. So we have to go into that. Uh, and this particularly uh, opportune moment, because I feel youth at this time is a much different kind of youth than we ever had in our history because of the technology because of all the things that we just said about the way uh, our young generation, even five, six year old, seven year old, the kind of uh, technology savvy they are, we are not fit for them. The way uh, we are kind of getting outdated, uh, our generation, by the amount of technology they absorb, they soak into them. They have tremendous amount of power, but they don't know where to put this power. So that's the framework that we have to build. You mentioned about uh, expansion and the scaling up. Uh, about the cooking stove. We started this cooking stove, built it into a business, selling cooking stove at the home, at, at the women's uh, place where she's cooking, so that we replace the old stove with the new stove. And it costs so little, and on top of it, we get CDM on top of it. We pass it on the CD, CDM to them, so it becomes very cheap. And she understands the economics of it right away. So we have, that is kind of rushing as a business. But that's a business, again, brings to a framework condition. Business today we know is a business to make money. And that's the only use we have for business. So I'm saying, so why don't we create another type of business, business to change life, without any intention of having any, 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 any a penny out of it for myself. I do the business to make money, which is good, I do that. But at the same time, I have a parallel business, business to impact on people's lives. That's what we are calling social business. And once we come into that social business framework, expansion can be explosive because now you are doing it in a business way, like we did in a, uh, in a um, renewable energy case where we have a company to sell solar home system. 
And in the beginning, it was too tough in Bangladesh to sell our home, to sell solar home system. Uh, tough to even sell five solar home system a month. Today, we sell more than 1,000 solar home system per day. It's a business, people love it, so it's expanding. Uh, so uh, the framework is a very important thing. Youth, technology, and the business concept. So these are the innovative things if you can put together, it becomes a scaling up very easy. Ma Madi, can you translate how that works, how that would work in your business? Uh, obviously, the technology is uh, on the cutting edge of innovation, but how would you take what you have learned in your world and put it on a larger scale and help other populations? <clears throat> I think that uh, before innovation, we have to be disruptive. And, um, and we have to, say, to face some uh, cool facts um, that we should stop ignoring them. Um, Cisco is making a lot of money from me. I buy a lot of Cisco systems. Communication is very important, but communication is a system. The question is what people communicate on those systems. We saw what happened uh, a couple of days ago in Norway, so the same great internet that can create great things for the world also was a tool to create some very harsh messages to the world and created some very hostile uh, environments. So when I look at the 21st century and I'm looking at what we're doing right now, I think the two major things have changed. You mentioned Einstein, so, so two major things have changed. Space and time. Space has changed because of, because of globalization. We don't see borders anymore the way they used to be. People move from one place to another. Trade is moving from one place to another. And time is changed because of the internet. We start living in the speed of light. And all those things mean that events that happens and things that happens are gonna happen so fast and they're gonna have so much effect and they're gonna be done so immediately that we all have to think differently about innovation and about how to make this world a better place. Uh, what really intrigues me about innovation and the way we look at things, we just, just by looking at what happened in the Middle East, <coughs> the amount of money which is being invested in the Middle East by intelligence organizations and by scholars and by academia is so vast. And yet, an hour before what happened in Tunisia, if someone would come to the head of the CIA and tell him, hey, Tomorrow, the president of Tunisia is going to be escaping to Saudi, and then Mubarak is going to go to prison, and then the leader of uh, 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 Syria is going to be, he would be fired immediately. Something about, we, 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 are, we, are, we are, something about this world we really basically don't understand. And, and we need really to be disruptive because things have really changed. Space and time really changed. You know, Ma, you talked about, um, about Oslo, I'm so struck. Here we are surrounded by cutting edge thinkers for the lack of a helicopter and a boat. All those children and young people <coughs> died because authorities could not get to them quickly, even when they realized what was happening. It, and you just made the point of how little we knew about what was happening in Tunisia, in Egypt and how surprised our own intelligence services were or how we didn't properly analyze or understand how the social media were transforming um, layers of communication within society. Uh, Judy, from the perspective of the <laughs> Rockefeller Foundation and all of the partners whom you see around the world in all of your travels, the world is changing a lot faster than we can keep up with it, despite these great technologies. So, it, absolutely, and what everyone has said is, is profoundly true. The system is completely upside down, and so we do need disruptive whatevers, disruptive technologies, disruptive new ways of thinking, uh, disruptive approaches, because the old methodologies aren't working. And that's why, without having the answers, we're trying to focus on innovation processes because at least it allows you to free your mind to be disruptive. It doesn't guarantee that it will happen, 
but it's a kind of mind opening way of approaching things that looking at the problem in the same way and defining it in the same way doesn't allow you to do. I mean, we're excited to, to the technology question about mobile technologies in particular, mm -hmm. because we really do think that they're disruptive. In the Middle East, they became disruptive as we saw those uh, events really unfolding. In the post-election violence in Kenya, when Ushahidi was formed, it was really about citizen reporting in a very disruptive way that didn't allow certain things to go unknown. In health, we're seeing really disruptive technologies through mobile where the last time I was in Dhaka recently and visited a very poor slum where a woman was getting extraordinary health care through mobile technology, something that we're not using in some of the developing country, uh, developed countries um, where we're spending a great deal more money. So I think it really is looking for and then being ready to be surprised because I really feel we're at a moment when nothing is readily predictable. And so we changed our model in university education from really thinking about conveying information to teaching people how to think. Because the information was available, so we didn't have to stand up there as professors and give didactic lectures. We had to train people to think differently once all of this information was available. I think we're at another similar inflection point. I think that we need to train ourselves to think differently if we're going to see solutions to some of these rapidly evolving situations and rapidly pressing problems. Some of you in particular, I think Paul Farmer, Mary Robinson, interact with government entities, which tend to be more sclerotic, I think, than, than the private sector, Vim, or some of the other NGOs, and, and certainly the work that you've been doing here at Rockefeller. Paul, how do you shake a government such as uh, the, the US government or the UN bureaucracy, Mary Robinson? You know, how do you turn around this huge um, ocean liner and deal with a crisis or a more chronic crisis? Well, when I was president of Ireland, oh wait. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but you know, I, I, I think, Andrea, that I, what, I'm, what I'm doing, and I, I, I really, you know, I've been lucky enough to talk with Mary over the years about some of these challenges. What, what strikes me is how different uh, the, these public-private partnerships can be depending on who the public partners are and who's private partners Does it depend are. on the individual players I think, I, I think more it than does. the structure? I, I think it does depend on leadership, and I'd like to hear uh, Mary's thoughts on that. But um, you also, you know, if I compare Haiti to Rwanda, two places I know, know pretty well, um, there is, there is, a, there is in, in Rwanda, uh, there has been a culture of entrepreneurial engagement. And again, this like like... I like the term, we were in the, we of course could hear Judy's comments when she was int introducing us. I love that extensive experience played <laughs> such a significant role in the CVs. But you know, one of the, one of the claims is that innovation is going to save us. And I, I think what you were saying is, well, the process is going to be good. It's not going to be necessarily some technology. In Rwanda, what has been cultivated over the last decade at least, and I think longer, has been uh, uh, first of all, platforms for transparency. Like how can we make government work for people more broadly? Gender equity has been a major uh, goal. Again, that's a, almost a, that, that's not a process goal, but they've said, you know, how can we make our public sector better uh, at the central level, at the district level? So interacting with some of these entities is very different from others. So back to your general question about the sluggishness I think there are very sluggish uh, states um, caught up in, uh, some of them are very large, and one understands why they're like ocean liners. They're quite literally enormous, vast. There are bureaucracies that are enormous and, and vast and, um, and, and slow things down. I think there are others that cultivate this idea of being innovative, being entrepreneurial, being open to change. The, the, the one thing I was thinking as we're going around the round robin is I keep on thinking, uh, I kept on thinking about cholera, and I know that's kind of my job to think about things like, well, let's call them 18th century diseases, 
Um, but in Haiti, where we as partners in health have been, I hope, nimble and innovative and helping rebuild public sector capacity, we still didn't, weren't able to prevent the explosive expansion of cholera because we can't replace the public sector as the private sector. Mm -hmm. So that's why I keep going back uh, to the need for the NGOs and the private sectors and the groups like the Foundation Worlds to try and find ways to engage with the public sector, even though it's not always easy. Sometimes we're lucky we have a great public interlocutor, good governance, mm -hmm. uh, and, but <clears throat> sometimes we don't have a great public sector interlock interlocutors, but we still need to try and do it because that's where we're gonna get some of the basic rights, you know, the right to health care, the right to, maybe the right to food security, I don't know, but certainly the right to clean water. These are, these really need to come from public sector engagement. Well, and I've been told, Mary, that in this current instance in Somalia, that the U.S. is quietly dealing with Al-Shabaab and trying to see if they can become a, a networking agent. Mm -hmm to get the yeah. food to the people mm. who need it. They are, in fact, uh, Al-Shabaab are allowing greater access, and I think this is exactly the way to move, and should have happened before, if you know what I mean. But um, at the same time, in the health center in uh, Somalia that I was in, uh, which was a health center I was in 19 years ago, and they had a photograph on the wall, which really was you know, kind of very uh, touching and at the same time depressing to see, because you had the same emaciated women with very malnourished children and the children were being weighed and assessed and then given these plumpy nuts, the two packets of plumpy nuts to bring up there to try to stabilize their weight. And the nurse was explaining that for a lot of the children, they weren't gaining weight because the other members of the family were desperately also you know, taking the plumpy nut, which you take straight out of the packet. You don't need any water, which is, which is good. And that's, that's the situation. There's not enough um, dry food. There's not enough food for the families as yet. And there needs to be a huge effort. And I'm glad there's more attention to it. But getting back to the wider issue you talked about, first of all, um, yes, having worked in the UN, I adopt what Winston Churchill said about democracy, uh, that democracy is the worst system except for all the others. Well, you know, the UN <laughs> is kind of what we have. But the UN has one extraordinarily important value, which sometimes we don't remember enough, and that is normative values. And of course, needless to say, the normative values I particularly uh, think about are the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Let's go back to what's happening um, in the Arab Spring. Uh, what's happening in, what happened in Tunisia and in Egypt, and it's now happening still in Syria, and in Yemen to a certain extent, and in Bahrain, where it's very repressed. Um, uh, the social media provided enough protection for people to understand that if I come out, there'll be at least 10 people, and maybe 100 who'll come out with me. It was a protection for asserting and what were they asserting? Human dignity, human rights, um, wanting to get rid of dictatorial government and corruption, and wanting jobs. And I think you know, it's, it's really very important that these are um, what drove millions onto the streets and are still driving them in the Middle East, because it shows that those are universal values for a start. And um, so I think that the, um, what Paul was talking about of how civil society groups should work with governments, especially poor governments. I agree with completely. In fact, I've had a lot of experience over the last number of years where uh, the traditional human rights approach was to name and shame. And there is a, a, a very honorable tradition of amnesty and human rights watch and et cetera, of, um, holding governments to account. But when you're talking about very poor governments, you also have to help their capacity, their capacity to build up their justice system, their capacity to build up their health system. And political will does matter. Um, I was in a poor African country just after the president had announced that he, um, it was important for his country that women and children would have access to free health care, um, lactating mothers, children under five, etc. in Sierra Leone. The donors were against it because the country was very poor and thought that um, Sierra Leone could not afford this. And the president said, um, I am ashamed that my country has the worst statistics for maternal mortality, one in eight women who become pregnant die. I don't accept that, so I'm going to insist. And of course, the donors had to step up to the plate because there was a political leadership. And then the NGOs worked on it. And so there's a much more rapid progress because there was the political will internally to do it. We have to encourage that. What about the role of social media, uh, Mati? Uh, there, there's a program now outside of the State Department that's actually been, been appropriated by the Foreign Relations Committee uh, 
to spend $10 million trying to work around the censorship in Iran and China in particular. And they believe they have come up with um, ways to, to counteract efforts by regimes to shut down the social media. Um, how practical is that? And are these innovative technologies one part to uh, the solution on participation and democracy? Well, before I relate to it, the last time the U.S. supported organizations like Al-Shabaab, they created out of, them, out of them different kind of organizations. So historically, so, so we have to be very careful about how much the U.S. Uh, can take. Uh, history proves a little differently. Second, I would suggest to all of us to wait a little bit and see who really won the political debate in the Middle East. And it might be that social media was there, but the results will be different from what we think. So we should not run to conclusions. I'm ready to bet. Uh, uh, so, uh, so again, we shouldn't think that social media is democracy. We shouldn't think that uh, there is a real debate over here. And people, I mean, we all talk about social media in terms of uh, the forces of democracy. Uh, I can tell you that we see our social media as being used by the other side also in a very expensive, in a very efficient way. So again, that means that we have to look at things in a real disruptive way. Uh, in regards to uh, the ability uh, to uh, penetrate and use uh, uh, US technology or any kind of technology to penetrate to other countries, uh, in order to be able to help them to make revolution, I would recommend at this point for the U.S. to work on their own revolution before they help other countries. Uh, well, innovation in the private sector is uh, you know, clearly the key to profit making, to success. But then you, you have, in moving to Bangalore and in living in, within the context of the people you're trying to help, how can innovation by, in the private sector be translated to help the poor and the vulnerable outside of the profit motive? So first, and I think we have to acknowledge that, like Mary said, we have a very unbalanced world. Um, so if you think in the private sector uh, that you can create innovation um, for unmet needs uh, in the developing world, um, and that's where you talk about inclusive growth, and that's where, like I said, you go with the population from uh, three billion additional people, and that I think you have to live in between to understand that. And that so for me, that from an innovation point of view, that you first have to understand what the unmet needs are. Um, and you have to live it, and you have to see it every day. And so that's why we built our second head office in India, and to understand it. And because India, with its uh, unique capabilities um, of creativity, uh, of mastering frugality, that they, they the country is also getting younger. And where you have young people, and you will have faster innovation. And because they started a different platform, they adapt. Um, but if you think about the bigger idea, and that we call it a platform, we call it a framework for innovation, and then what we really have to do, I think, all together is that we have to create a new industry. We call that the industrialization of the internet. And so not just connectivity, not just access, but really also get participation between people, uh, between machines, make buildings more intelligent, and that we have to do something on, on, on energy, and that we have to reach you. We can't go on like we did, and we can't just also build more roads, and that we have to think in different patterns. And so the framework for innovation, I think, that the private sector has a task to do, yeah, but we engage with governments um, and whether that's at a uh, national level, at a local level, who are also innovative, uh, who think in smart regulation, who come up with frameworks uh, to enable that innovation, uh, that we think about public-private partnerships, uh, we think about creating ecosystems. Uh, because I think more and more uh, innovation is going to be an, a comprehensive set um, of tools, of people, of smart regulation uh, to be able to scale. Otherwise, you will always stick to a proof of concept, and that's what you see in Africa a lot, in India. But how to get you know, three billion people uh, in a decent life, 
with access, uh, with food, uh, access to health care, and then some prosperity for their children. It, it's a framework, um, and I think all different uh, government bodies, NGOs, we have to work together, and I think we first have to start to find each other. And, and that, that's what I'm very much looking forward uh, to this initiative of the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, to get the right people engaged, and let's get some action, and let's do things that we can truly scale, and that will benefit the underprivileged of the world. Uh, Dr. Yunus, is there a new idea on finance, a new financial innovation that can help push some of these goals forward? Well, I'm sure there are many uh, some uh, exploding in that direction. The fact that uh, uh, financial services can be brought to the poorest person uh, that has been established is a question of how to make it more uh, effective, more efficient, more cost effective, and so on. So those things will keep happening with the technology that we are talking about. Those, those things will uh, come very soon. But again, we need to solve the fundamental question like you raised the question of the role of the government and uh, others. Uh, government will, uh, by definition, will remain uh, non-innovative because they don't have that capacity. Not that they're bad people, but the structure doesn't allow them to do that. Uh, all the innovation, and you said, in, uh, explosion of innovation in the private sector because it's a business. So the explosion of, and it will continue. Imagine the amount of innovation and amount of technology contained in one little hand handphone. It's a uh, mobile phone hand uh, handset, iPhone, for example. If we could use that kind of innovation in solving the problem that we are talking about, I think the back of these problems will be broken right away. But we are not using it. Because all the technologies are in the command of the business. And they are using this technology to make money, which is their mission. Uh, nobody can blame that. So technology is a kind of a vehicle. Uh, the driver decides where they want to go. So, th so today, the, in the driver's seat, it is the business which is sitting there. So they are taking to the, at the height of the profit. If somehow we can put this driver changed, uh, the same driver, probably with a different intention, and that's what I call about the social business, to change the problems of the world. These problems will not exist very long because the power of the technology is so enormous. And, and once we can involve the business to address this, we today divide it up. Government should look at the problems, let them handle it. Private sector, meaning the business, profit-making sector, they will continue to focus on money. And there are NGOs, philanthropies, and other things. And then there'll be, now we talk about the private, uh, public-private partnership. Again, who is the winner in the private-public uh, partnership? Is the business who is the winner, not the government? Uh, so how do you create a separate entity which is a business but not a profit-driven business? Say all people can do that. Use the technology that they have in command to use it to solve the problem, create a different kind of space, which is a social business space. Then all these things, bringing services and so on, will be solved, it will solve itself. And a replication, uh, reaching out in an explosive way, because once business does something, it explodes. It doesn't take time because it's a business, it rolls out things. Uh, so the, the idea of social business is, is that, uh, just to give an example uh, from our own experience with a joint venture, with a traditional, conventional business like Danone. We have a Grameen Danone partnership as a social business to bring the nutrition among the children of Bangladesh. What we have done, we created a special kind of yogurt, put all the micronutrients into that yogurt and made it very delicious and made it very cheap so that every child can eat it. All it needs, two cups of this yogurt within a week. And you continue this for several months, up to eight months or nine months, child gets back all the micronutrients. It's a business, but not for making money for anybody, but to solve the problem without any intention of having any uh, benefit or uh, uh, profit for them. So if Danone can do that, BSF is doing that, and many other companies like Uniqlo and others in that. So how to bring that up if the businesses can get interested in it as a side business, not as a kind of give up that you replace. We're not talking about replacement. A parallel kind of business, uh, which brings the technology into it. Young people get excited about it. Their, their innovative ideas can come into it. Investment can take place into it. So we have to redesign the system of the very conceptual framework of the economic system so that we, can, we have a two business world rather than one business world. 
And that is one that we can solve the problem. Andrew, can I yes. talk about two other finance models briefly just to, to add texture? Um, social impact investing is, in fact, a double bottom line investment. It allows companies to want to make money and have a finan financial return. It's also looking for a social return. And there's a lot of private investment capital now going into social impact businesses. One of the reasons that's attractive is that there's so many social entrepreneurs on the demand side looking for capital to grow these wonderful ideas. And it's a space that the private investors have stayed away from. So how you manage that field and facilitate that set of markets is a very, very interesting opportunity. The second interesting opportunity, and very germane to what's going on in Washington and indeed around the world, is how do you get governments to spend their money more effectively? If we say that we're not going to be able to only tax our way out, if we really do see that for all nations this is going to be a lower growth period until we get some fundamental reorganization and change, um, then how can they use their money more effectively? And so. Uh, we've been funding grantees who are working on social impact bonds, the first of which is floated right now in Great Britain. And what they do is take very proven social outcomes. In this, it's how you re reduce the rate of juvenile reoffending, which the British government felt was costing them enormous amounts of money because the juvenile reoffenders often come back within six weeks. So they were able to identify some extraordinarily successful programs. And they're actually selling bonds in the retail market, and the bondholder will be paid out if, they, if the government is able, using this technique, to reduce the rate of juvenile reoffending to a certain level. And it was done actuarially so that the government figured out the threshold at which they would save lots and lots of money rather than spending it on juvenile reoffending, on paying out the bondholders. This is a massive innovation that government is trying. There are now several governments, state governments in the United States that are picking that up. Again, think smartly about new financing models that really can get double and triple wins out of the ever more precious resources that we have to invest in all of these things. Mary, and one of the things I was thinking about is what do you do when you have competing interests? You have a climate change initiative and you want to make sure that it doesn't impact on food development. But at least according to the, the current technological programming, mm -hmm. they are actually working at, at, mm -hmm. against each other. Well, I was a bit stimulated by what <clears throat> Judy was saying to um, talk about an area that we're looking at in the Foundation on Climate Justice that I, I, I have established in Ireland. Um, you have in a number of countries, Ethiopia for example, the social um, safety, um, um, productive safety nets system, which has the, some of the poorest, about seven and a half million in Ethiopia, who work for uh, uh, cows, chickens, you know, some, and the work they do is quite environmentally uh, progressive water management, planting trees, sort of thing. But there's been no attempt to let them have access to clean energy. So if they got access to clean energy, they would progress probably more rapidly. And we're trying to uh, link, link across. I think Vim was talking about this as well. Um, we need to make connections. Um, I think in a, a partnership way, we actually, in the 21st century, know now that the way to make real progress is this kind of broad partnership where governments have to be involved, local authorities have to be involved, but also the private sector and non-governmental organizations. And I think, certainly in my experience in a more human rights context, there is more willingness now of um, non-governmental organizations to work with business, provided business is committed to a progressive outcome, and business is getting more comfortable about working more closely with NGOs and being more um, transparent and open about what's happening. And I, I think that these are the kind of connections. But um, uh, what we need to do is scale up access to affordable renewable energy for the poorest, again, for climate reasons, as we all must uh, mitigate and reduce um, the fossil fuel. Um, and uh, the potential for that scaling up, I think, is enormous if we, uh, if we can align 
Um, uh, those who, uh, I mean, uh, Yunus is doing it, as he said, um, with um, households in, uh, in um, Bangladesh. <coughs> and there are <coughs> NGOs and social entrepreneurs doing it for 100,000 people here and 20 villages there. But we're talking about millions of people, 1.4 billion people who have no access to electricity in our world today. Um, that should be a goal that within a decade um, that's addressed. Um, and how do, we, how do we find the ways to do that? It does seem that we, especially in the cities, uh, Tokyo, New Orleans, are seeing in recent years horrendous weather events. Mm -hmm. um, and city, how can cities then be better able to confront some of these disasters, which seem to be happening with greater frequency? Um, that's a tough one. I would say first uh, be realistic is scenario planning. And it's so I'm always amazed um, at it. Uh, when I moved to India, a lot of people said that's risky. Um, you know, what did you do to deserve this? <laughs> and because, and it, but, but you know, if, if you, I, I, normally I lived uh, the last 10 years in California, and actually I live four kilometers from the Andreas Fault. So, you know, what, what is more How do you risky? assess risk? <laughs> How do you assess risk? Uh, but the, the point I've tried to make is that so risk assessments, uh, scenario planning, uh, again, use technology um, for um, outcomes. Um, and then, and I think that is always what is the worst thing that never happens, practice, practice, practice. And so scenario planning, uh, make sure that, that you have a plan ready. And also, if you look at terrorist attacks where it always goes wrong, is that people had no action plan prepared. And in the first half hour, and it, it, it's, you know, people don't know what to do. They can't communicate, and they, they, they don't work together. There is no master plan how to attack it. And even if you have then that master plan, if you not regularly practice it, you know, and this is the difficult word, discipline, it, it, it doesn't happen. And, and your example and it, of Norway is an, an example. And it, an island and nobody knew how to come there. And so it takes half an hour, an hour. And it's done. The same with weather. And when we looked at New Orleans, um, that when we looked at, uh, at Japan, that, that, that scenario planning, um, actions in place, and then discipline and rehearse. And finally, in the, in the minute or so we have left, Paul, we're at a state of such crisis in our government. I mean, I've never seen it as dispiriting as it is right now in all the years that I've covered Washington and, and other governments at the state and local level. Is there some way that those of you who you know, think innovatively, who deal across barriers, can help us spark some sort of hope that we can revisit our own structures, which you know, are perfect in design, but in the way they have evolved are just not working? Gulp. Big, big, big gulp, but big, big uh, idea, big thought about our I, society here at home. I, I um, just as a, as a citizen and as a physician as, uh, and someone who's been, has lived through some difficult times in, in Haiti recently, I would, I would say that we need to do more to acknowledge complexity. You know, you talk about scenario planning. Uh, you talk about a tsunami or an earthquake or a government shutdown. Um, I, I don't think there's any one innovation or solution to that, of course. I think if we go back to process innovations, like Judy said, it, it, as Mary reminded us, participation. Uh, you know, it's, what does community participation mean? It's, it's more uh, buzzword, more jargon. But in, in public health, um, I think that finding ways to make sure there's broader participation by the people most affected has always uh, served us well in, in public health and medicine. And to the extent that that's useful when you look at the kind of uh, challenges you're covering in Washington right now, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's one of those lessons that we can draw is that there are process innovations now before us that allow more and more people to participate, at least in principle. I wish that I could see that happen in Haiti and Rwanda and the United States. I, I just wonder, you know, somebody who has been educated in this country, who feels very at home in this country, and who's following, as you said, um, 
the, the very dysfunctional way in which um, you know politics is, is, is playing out. Whether uh, what is almost needed is a wider debate about the changing world we're in, which I think the United States is trying in some measure to accommodate to, but maybe isn't talking enough about. Uh, you know, the, the world is changing now very rapidly, uh, demographically, in power terms. If you look at the renewable energy, uh, it's China that is, uh, you know, uh, investing in and uh, making huge headway there. And um, in a way, uh, what I miss is a kind of conversation about the United States and the world as opposed to just um, what's happening in a, in a you know, that um, uh, it, it is um, important that the United States rapidly adjusts to the changes that are taking place in the world and finds a way of uh, perhaps playing more of a leadership role again in that context. Well, that is exactly what our conveners hope that we're inspiring. So I want to thank all of you, uh, Vim Elfring and Madi Kahavi and Dr. Paul Farmer, uh, Professor Eunice, Mary Robinson, Dr. Roden, for kicking this off because now your comments are going to inspire us to all be thinking more and will engage everyone who's here in the audience in our breakout sessions uh, as we think about innovation and the way we can break down some of these barriers demographically, generationally, economically uh, to brainstorm how to resolve or at least attack some of these problems that are not. I want to thank all of you. and. Uh, to that end, I'd like to now invite Mark Gerzen and the Rockefeller Foundation's Vice President for Strategy and Evaluation, Dr. Zia Khan, to come up to the stage and briefly introduce the Innovation Forum's next event, which will be the breakout sessions that will begin really digging deeper into some of these ideas. Thanks to all of you. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, and I just want to extend it out.